Happy New Year and a wonderful New Year 2024. My name is Daniel Stecher and it's the very first Aviation Women Panel in 2024. It's the 41st in total um, and it's a very special one again because uh, today you are getting to know my Mandy from Women in Aviation and Logistics, Sina Hadwig. We had the fantastic mentorship program uh, last summer and um, I convinced her to give a talk about her business, the change she was yeah, living through and also managing for a company. And meanwhile, she changed again. So now she's a new uh, job role. And uh, I'm happy that I could convince her to give a talk on Ladies Beyond Flying Aviation Women Panel. Zina, stage is yours, and uh, I wish us fantastic 45 minutes. I will help Zina, so please raise your hand uh, if you have a question with the feature of MS Teams, and then I will call you in, and we prefer to have all your questions formulated verbally. Zina, stage is yours, and you will start the screen sharing from your device, isn't it? Yes, we'll do so. Perfect. Then I will also see you so i have my uh, screen shared on the on the other um monitor so if you have questions just jump in first of all good evening good morning good day to every one of you and happy new year hope that the new year brings you joy healthy as well as a good and successful time so um what i have prepared for now is uh, wait here we are again, making a change in an ever changing world. So this was the title of my presentation and I was like thinking about, OK, I love change, but the title is super broad. So I've tried to, let's say, put it a bit more, let's say, in breaks and uh, to explain where I come from and what I can share today with you. So I will start with my intro. So who am I? and uh, what is my background and uh, of course why I do love change and then I want to put let's say the aviation market not like um, market intelligence slides but I want to show you why I think that we all work in a market where change is crucial and change is like in every pocket we have and I just want to let's say emphasize and be open for the change which is surrounding us. And then I would like to share my recent change journey. So I was responsible for a transport management system rollout um, where we've brought uh, 200 people on a new system. And I would like to share my journey and my learnings. And I hope that everyone can, let's say, enjoy a bit the journey we've had as well as um, get some insights. And the last one is like, empowering change so i think we are all like in the driver's seat of bringing change to each and every corner and i want to put this everything together and let's be super open when it comes to change so let's start with the intro who am i i've took the most cutest picture i think with my dog and my daughter. <laughs> my husband was a bit disappointed that I didn't took a picture where he is as well. So my name is Sina, I'm 31 years old. Um, I'm a mother, I'm a wife, I'm a dog owner, I work as a project manager and there are some things which are, let's say, on my uh, personal side, I would love to share because maybe it also gives you a bit more of context when it comes to some topics, when it comes to change like for example I'm a yogi so I'm I like I love the topic of being mindful energetic and um, sometimes it's also pretty good when it comes to change processes of being resilient so uh, I actually learned a lot especially on my during my yoga classes I'm a change lover and I also like to spend some time in nature so it gives me power and I could just emphasize each one of you, just uh, go out during your breaks, enjoy the nature because it gives you energy, it gives you power and it makes you resilient when it comes to change. So um, 
then I would like to give you a brief overview about my professional career. That's just a quick one, but maybe it gives you already a bit of a background like where I come from. And obviously, I mean, I've used the header like I'm a logistics expert with a heart beating for diversity and change. Like I love diversity, so I'm super glad that I can be here today because I love the network and I love that it's the ladies network led by Daniel, which is actually pretty cool. Um, and I've actually learned like whenever I change something, not even on a professional side, but also on a personal side, that something better happened. Like whenever I did something, it's going to be better afterwards. So that's something I've learned also in my private life, but also on the professional side. So I want to share with you a bit where I was working, what was, let's say, my milestones during my career. I've started my career with Kuno Nagel and I've worked in air operations. Afterwards, I went over through key account management and was responsible for the BPM part for the air freight afterwards. So you already see like I have uh, two hearts in my um, two hearts beating. The one is for sales, the one is for operations. And I'm always like trying to navigate which one is like beating faster right now. Um, after my time with Kuno Nagel, I want to see a different industry. So I've went to a sustainable food brand and worked there as a key account manager as well. Um, and afterwards, someone asked me during my the time I was working as a BPM, we've implemented a new TMS with Kuno Nagel as well. And someone asked me if I wanted to do it again. <laughs> and I said like, hell no, <laughs> I did it already. And I don't want to do it again. But then, I mean, the time we did it with Kuno Nagel, we were like implementing a software which we've built on our own. And every time we've had issues, we were like telling each other, okay, if we would have bought something, we wouldn't have the problem. So I was super curious, like seeing the part of implementing a transport management system, which is actually the market leading system. Um, yeah, so. I've joined Hellman and I've started as a position as a change manager as well as the head of business process management for air freight. So the full responsibility for the cargo wise goal of as well as the change journey, which lays ahead of us. Yeah, and recently I've jo I've um, moved positions. So I've moved to our, it's super bad that my camera is too, too low because I have our Hellman IT and D hoodie uh, um, I'm wearing the hoodie, so I've moved to our IT and D department, and I'm responsible um, as project manager digital, together with my colleague Anna. You see on the screen, so Anna, glad that you're here. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's just some side notes where I come from. What is my journey so far? Right now, I want to focus a bit on the aviation market to show you a bit what kind of change process already already lay behind us so what kind of market do we love because i think everyone who's working on the market is a bit like crazy <laughs> it's super fast but it's super cool and i want all of you let's say to value that a bit right because i think that's something pretty special we have and that's just amazing to have a market like that but when i thought about the change on the market i think it's nice to have a quick flashback because when you just see what happens during the last years it is pretty tough that our operations was able to adapt to all of these changes because all these changes you see on this slide like COVID, what happened in Ukraine, the Suez Canal, um, we have Israel and now we have the Red Sea like each and every of these crises had an immediate effect on the way how we work together. So change is nothing where we say, oh, we've decided we've implemented TMS, but we have several changes around us where we just have to, let's say, understand that the next change is right around the corner, right? So whenever we think about change, it is not just about us deciding we want to go for something, but also in understanding that the major changes are not the changes we've decided for. It's not like 
we decide that something pretty bad is happening in the Red Sea. It's just happening and it's turning our operations upside down because once again, everyone has to, has adapt, has to adapt to the new situation and to understand what's going on there. So just to have in mind that change is everywhere. And then I asked ChatGPT for a more poetic version of saying like change is all around the corner and it's everywhere. And I think ChatGPT was pretty well. So change is a silent orchestra of our journey, painting the canvas of life with the brush strokes of evolution. That's pretty deep, isn't it? <laughs> so um, afterwards, I've thought a bit about why, what can we do, let's say, to get our mind and our brain and our attitude towards being open-minded to the situation of changes everywhere. And the first thing, going back to my yoga mat, is resilience, like the behavior of coping with stress will remain to the situation that we can maintain our productivity while going through a change. And additionally, which is a pretty good, good side effect, I would say, it will take care of our health and our well-being. The second part, which is, let's say, first take care of your own brain, but then take care of the people surrounding you, like teamwork. So support each other on the journey through the process because everyone is somewhere else. Like while I'm already there, like, okay, we are good to go. So <laughs> thank you, Anna. <laughs> um, while I'm already, let's say, good to go, maybe my manager is still in the position of telling me, oh, I have doubts and I don't want to go there. And I do not think that this is the right way to go. So support each other and create an environment of psychological safety. The next biggest part, I would say, is a part of communication. So whenever you communicate transparently and you involve as many stakeholders as you can, like it is, for example, in Germany, if we have had so many issues with the work council and we've had so many talks with them, but whenever we spoke to each other, the situation got better. So I just want to emphasize, go out, speak to each other. And if it's just a coffee talk, but you will always work on your relationship and you will do it better. So let's say creating an environment where you understand each other and just shape the a culture of alignment and trust. And the last thing, is the adaptability. So be flexible when it comes to change and you will find a quick and efficient way of having an, having an improvement. So we remember changes everywhere. Our market is changing like every month, it feels like. And um, these are for me the most crucial pillars when it comes to um, the change process itself. So we've had the intro, we had the aviation market, and now we go over to the change journey we've had with Helman. So how brought we the change to our team? First of all, maybe to, let's say, um, um, keep it a bit more small because not small. It's not small. I mean, it, I was responsible for bringing the change to the German organization. So, of course, it is a global rollout, but my responsibility was within our German team. So maybe also keeping in mind that sometimes the German culture is a bit, let's say, strict and not that open when it comes to change. You mean stiff? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Um, and we've Splitted the process in four steps. And the first process, and you see it already on that slide, we've started with the change. So, and that's something pretty special, especially in comparison to the rollouts I've already seen. Most of the time you start with a system and then you check, okay, is there where do I need change management? But we've did it 
the other way around. We started, okay, we want to create an environment where everyone knows how a change process is in our brains, how I can go through, how I can manage it, and how I can guide my teams through these processes. So we've started already one and a half year before the official goal life of the system. Afterwards, we've started, of course, with the rollout preparations, like documenting the processes, deciding which processes will stay, which processes will go on, developing these interfaces. Afterwards, when we as the BPM team were settled a bit, not a bit, we were settled. <laughs> we've started with the training of the key users. So we've had key users at each and every station guiding the, the colleagues on site through the process. And then afterwards, we've had a go live on November 1st. But of course, we've had the hypercare where everyone was located at the stations, taking care of the support requests and um, taking care of the situation in our offices. But there's like overall the frame how we established the TMS go live. But today, of course, we talk about the change journey. So I've tried to figure out what kind of milestones did we have. And the first thing we do was the, nominate, the nominating key change agents within the teams. And our requirement was we have 10 stations in Germany that each and every department has at least one change agent. Because of course, we have smaller offices, we have larger offices. So for example, in Frankfurt, we are about 100 people, while don't know, in Hanover, we are 15 or something. But still, each and every department has to have at least one of these agents. And these agents should not belong to the management team. So they should be the operators working with the system because we want not to have these like um, top down approach. We want to have it bottom up so that everyone within our organization understands the ability how to adopt to change process. Afterwards, we brought these change agents in the existing structure. So we as a organization, we have a change headquarter. We have change pilots in the region. Then we have change leads within the country. So I was the change leader for Germany. And then we have the change agents at the stations. But it was important, let's say, to bring them all together so that they talk to each other, that they exchange ideas, get to know each other and work together. I have a That's question regarding the change agents. Mm -hmm. Do mm -hmm. they have something in common? So is there is there a certain personality type they need to... Um, uh, represent or is there any pattern where you would say, okay, there are certain people who are better to be a change agent and other have maybe better skills to have a different role in this entire organization? Actually, I would love to have that. I mean, I would love to have, let's say, a, a structure where we say, okay, these and that personality is a well fit for taking over the role as a change agent. In our case, it was more like, okay, we hopefully we find someone volunteer, volunteering for another role. But basically, from my perspective, you need someone who is pretty well connected. So it's not that relevant to have someone like super open and like just taking each and every idea, just making a better picture out of it, you need someone who's able to talk to a person and being well connected, right? So if you have someone, I wouldn't say that an introvert is not a good fit, but you will at least have some issues with that because you need someone like talking to each other, understanding where the pain points are and being open like to emphasize the team of sharing their emotions and their feelings. And I think for that, you have to be pretty good connected. So for me, that's the most crucial part, I would say. Answer? So in this book, in this book from Thomas Erickson, I would say this goes into the yellow personality type. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs>
The third pillar is the training. So we've spent a lot of time with training these colleagues. So we've had monthly sessions where we've explained like one of my favorite um, favorite parts was, of course, something like a house of change. But we've also went through the iceberg model. We've had active listening sessions. So we've really tried to teach them how to behave, how to understand, be a bit more like a psychological uh, expert when it comes to change. And the last part, which is also from my perspective, the hardest part is, let's say, form them as a team and let's start the exchange. And this was pretty tough for me because it's not like me telling them what to do but they have to start to work with each other. They have to build their own connections to each other and understand like, okay, I'm located in Hanover and I have the same problem like the colleagues in Frankfurt. Let's connect, let's share ideas and let's say, I will leave my office. I would just call them and ask, okay, how do you do that? And can I take it over um, as a solution for the problem I'm facing? So these are the milestones we've had. And these are the topics I want to highlight once more because I think they're pretty important during the process. So first of all, the training, and we've spent a lot of time on training our colleagues. And taking stepping a step backwards and thinking about what and how we've trained I think we could do less, but we should focus more on getting the things we've really trained into an action. Let's say, for example, one of my favorite, let's say, classes was active listening. And I love active listening. I like to understand where, what the, um, what the person really want to say to me. But we've we've taught that several times and I didn't have the feeling that the colleagues are really using it when they are speaking to their teams. So I think that first of all, training is, like, training is not enough. You have to have the people like doing it, using it, understanding what they've learned. Anastasia, you have yes. active, listened and have a question. Perfect. <laughs> Quick question for Zina in regards to training and just given like the example of Germany, right? Because it's such a big uh, country for Hellman. It's one of the biggest operations that they have. How do you time the training across all offices to kind of, you know, if you train someone and then a month later they have to use the system, by the time they get to actually using it in action, they forget, right? How do you actually make sure the training is still fresh in their minds? Was there like a test environment that you had for them where they could play around or like how was that, you know, timed maybe? Yeah. And um, that's more related to the system training. So for us, we've had a period of six months where we've trained the entire organization and we've had colleagues who've went through the end user training end of August while we've went live beginning of November. So we've had a big gap between the training and the go live. They've had a test environment, yes, but did they use a test environment? I don't think so because the workload, especially during that time was pretty high because we've had so many people joining the end user trainings. So the, the teams were already short on staff and actually, and there I was pretty lucky in regarding the key user um, structure we've had, and we've had really, really good key users. So the selection there was really good. And they've organized, let's say, refresher sessions. So the week before we went live, we aligned with the key users. Let's say, okay, let's focus just on the, if you work in air freight export, please go through the export operational process and just go step by step just to have, let's say, a refresher for the team. And in addition to that, we've started, we've had a soft go live where we've captured the files flying on the 1st of November in the system. 
And we've started during the soft go live, which was one and a half week before the official go live, where we've already sent like tip of the days. Like keep in mind that this is important. It was just a quick working instruction where we've just put some information together and spread it through the entire organization. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, the second pillar is the remote session. Of course, we did a lot remote, but it's super valuable to see each other in person. So we've had just two sessions where we've met live, but I've really felt like after the live session, the behavior, the attitude, also the things that people did were way better than after our remote session. The third pillar is the leadership support. And also the leadership support, I mean, I've said that we've decided that we do not want to have the management team as part as uh, as part of the change agents. So we've had operators there and sometimes it was pretty hard for them to, let's say, get the audience of the management team that change is important. So. Also, when I think about it now, I think we should have involved the leaders even more to show the importance of change management and also to emphasize that they sit together with the team, get to know each other, talk about change, what is important, where the station stands right now, what kind of measures they have, things like that. And the fourth part, which is for me the importance, so it's also the largest one, if you see that, um, is the attitude. And Daniel, you've already asked like how we selected who's the right change agent. And the most important point for me is like the attitude has to be right. You have to have someone who likes to communicate with the other colleagues, who likes to take up emotions and understands, okay, don't know, Daniel is just super afraid when it comes to the system go live. And I think I need to have a conversation with him and maybe with the team lead or whomever. So attitude is one of the things I want to stress a bit more because you can train as much as you want, but if the attitude is not right, you won't go anywhere. So last slide for that topic. My learnings, focus is crucial. So as you've seen already, I've had like several hats. I was the change lead. I was the um, team lead of the business process management team. And I was working as a business process manager myself because we've had the go live ahead of us. So we've had to implement these interfaces. We've had to write the process documentation. It was just like not me stepping out and being just the leader. It was me being the leader, the change agent, as well as the business process manager. So I would be really happy to have a focus during that time. So just to to have, let's say, a, not a not a clear guidance. It wasn't I wasn't missing the guidance, but I had just too many tasks on my desk to focus on the change topic the most. But I think focusing on change is always crucial. And I've really felt it during hypercare, for example, that the stations where we've had a strong change team were doing way better than the others. So you could really feel it in the air then. Communication is key. So as I've already said, we've had many, many talks with the work council, for example, where we've tried to pick them up where we are, what kind of changes are coming. And um, but of course, you can always communicate more. You can always communicate better, but do it. Communication is always a key and just use Teams, call the colleague, call the manager, just ask where do they stand? What do they need? What's their impression when it comes to the Teams? And the last one, which is actually a learning I've already learned during the last two weeks while I'm in my new position, is find measures and create value, right? Because, of course, we've had questionnaires when it comes to change, but measuring them and understand how the change really created a value to our company is pretty hard. So I think next time I would spend more time 
on understanding what kind of value we are creating because it also gives me some kind of confidence where we stand, right? So it's good to have like a value in place where you want to want to go for. And then we are already at my last point, empowering change. And I thought we as a network, what can we do today? So we've already learned like, okay, change is everywhere in the, everywhere in the market. I gave you an example of, okay, how did we took up the broad topic of change management and narrowed it down a bit to our transport management uh, system go live. But I think the point which is way more important is like, okay, and how can we as a, as a group of women, sorry, Daniel, <laughs> do better and uh, empower each other? And I thought that the first thing to really reali realize is diversity is a key driver for change. And having diverse team will make us even better when it comes to a change process. I mean, we have so much creativity in our mind. And as a diverse team, we are way better in problem solving, right? So I think that this is really one of the most crucial part, I would say. And the second part is empowerment. So we are already a group of 12 people right now in this room. So how can we empower each other for the next change process, for the next donor position or whatever? I think this is one, um, something pretty um, crucial. And also, of course, empowerment comes with a network, the usage of a network, right? I've had a super mind-blowing situation. I think it was beginning of December. And Daniel already told me, Sina, just use the network, ask questions, ask who's going to support your workshop, who's going to moderate it or whatever. And we've had an issue with our uh, electronic consignment security declaration. So everyone who's in freight forwarding might know. So it was a bit tricky to understand also the guidelines from the, uh, from the IATA. And then I've just wrote in our Women in Aviation Logistics WhatsApp group and said, okay, who's an expert in that and who's able to help me? And it, it took uh, Celine, I don't know, two minutes to respond. Sina, here's my contact at Dieta. Just give them a call and tell them greetings from myself. And I was so happy and was just like, we were sitting on the problem for a month. We are thinking about it on and on and we haven't found a solution yet. And then it was just a WhatsApp message just asking, like, I have a problem and is, does someone have a contact who is able to help me? Yeah, and afterwards, actually, we solved it in a week. So we've had a call with them. They told us what was our misunderstanding, actually, and we were done. So make use of the network, ask for help, and going back to point two, empower each other. And the last point I want to um, to highlight is uh, get in the driver's seat. And um, I've read this morning something, so uh, please use the sentence below as a quote unquote. Uh, opportunity always come by like train. It's on us to buy a ticket and hop on. So we can decide if we want to hop on the change process. Sometimes we can't decide because the train is just hitting us. But it's on us if we want to hop off or if we stay at the train station and wait for the next opportunity to come. So my answer to the headline I received by Daniel is, it's on, <laughs> it's on us to make a change in an ever-changing world. And I think that's the most important part. So thank you all for listening. I hope you have plenty of questions and that we can exchange. And of course, uh, let's connect, right? So building a network, empower each other, support each other. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Zina. Maybe you stop screen sharing and then we see mm -hmm. each other in the group. Um, my first comment would be, of course, it's all very positive and so on. And you have not mentioned anything about the conflicts in this change management. <laughs> Um, because 
of course, we put um, focus on training and we do this and that and we nicely communicate. But I think we all have to admit life is not always easy peasy. So maybe you can share some of the situations where there was a conflict and um, because I think this is also important to share because all the other who want to change something will meet conflicts here and there. And if they know from you how you handle the one or the other conflict, they can just redo and maybe have an easier conflict management. Yeah, conflicts and change are like change behind the next corner. So, and the first thing which is pretty important or was pretty important for me that I do not take it personal. It was tough because there were discussions which were not like professional, but also pretty emotional. But the second thing is, and there the training part comes once again, understand in which part of the change process the person is actually. So understanding like, Daniel is in the room of denial, helps me to get a more empathetic way to understand where he actually stands. So I just want to stress that most of the emotional conflicts are not between the conflicts are, sorry, happening between assholes, but because someone on the other side has fears, doubts, concerns, don't know. So first of all, empathize with the person, understand where the person stands, what kind of feeling is behind maybe an emotional expression and to emphasize a bit with that. And in addition, if it is super emotional, step out. Step out and say, okay, we will have, let's keep it as it is for now. And we will continue our discussion, talk, don't know, in two or three days. You were talking about training. How are you training yourself? So how have you educated <laughs> yourself? How have you gained the tools and skills? Which books are you reading? Maybe you can give some insights about that. Yes. So training. System-wise, spending hours and hours and hours in front of a system, training, testing, learning. Change. I love TED Talks, actually. So I think this is one of the greatest platforms you could use for educating yourself. And I'm a heavy podcast listener. But basically, most of the podcasts I'm listening right now are more towards agile um, mindset agile growth because that's right now the topic I try to learn and get to use the entire to the entire framework and when it comes to let's say for example positivity and understanding where we stand right now I highly recommend two books which the first one is factfulness if you haven't read that I think Daniel you know about it and the other I'm not quite sure how it is the official wording because it's a German translation, but uh, Rutger Bregmann, he is a Dutch author, which has the, I have to check, basically good or something like that would be the translation, I assume, but I will share it in the group afterwards, what kind of book it is. So let's say working on the, on the mindset of staying positive helps me a lot, especially when it comes uh, to reading, for example, because I tend to read things which like empower me on a positive way. Further questions from the audience? Ome. Hi, first of all, thank you. Thank you for uh, the session, Sina. Amazing. I could definitely relate to what uh, you gave um, on the change management where we always say that change is constant. Yeah. And getting to adapt to the change, though we keep saying there is a lot of processes, we have a lot of things. But as Sina said, there's a lot of resilience required, a lot of patience required and uh, communication focus is 
Turkey. Yeah, I just had one question, Sina, because a lot of uh, uh, project implementation that is happening uh, on our side as well. Training being the key. Yeah, and you also mentioned saying that a lot of testing and trainings that you did. Uh, just one question I had was saying that is there some kind of a training data prep preparation that you did? Did we have a specific scenarios being designed uh, uh, for the trainings or is there what was the methodology of your trainings as well? One thing what I liked about you saying that having an anchor in every station to ensure that there is a bit of focus um, and stuff, but I was a little keen to know who was managing if there is any training data required and um, you said there is a there was a training environment as well which is safer not you know uh, disturbing the testing which usually happens parallel if you really see when the implementation is happening so just keen to know what was your test data management process or how the trainings were planned if you could just give some highlights be nice. Yeah, um, maybe two points. First of all, the training itself, when we speak about the official end user training, it was super related to the operational process. So we've had the process design and then we've trained step by step the operational process right in the training system. So we were not like giving some some guidance. And of course, it was a classroom training, right? So it was no, uh, no webinar, no e-learning. It was full classroom training. Right. And in addition to that, uh, testing. So we've tested several scenarios. So for example, Anna thinking about custom implementation. So we've, te we've tested our implementations, for example, and there was a design of test cases, but as you might know, all of them are pretty limited because as you already said, like seeing something live always brings entirely different topics up than you've ever thought about, right? So yeah. it's just a test environment is always pretty limited. So of course, we've had test cases where we assumed, okay, we've documented all our existing processes. So we thought we were super confident that our test cases are super good and that they're super well prepared within the test system. So our tests went well. Then we went live and then you see what's actually happening within within our operations. So I think you can never test to 100 percent. If you already reaches 80, it's already good. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions from the audience, please. Alettina. Uh, hi, Zina. Thank you for so hi. nice, interesting uh, presentation. Uh, following up on training question, uh, you mentioned that you had training only, classroom training, mm -hmm. and uh, the same way you said you had uh, so many change agents. Uh, how you managed having all in uh, for the classroom training? I mean, uh, not having this remote or online um, program. How you manage this in housing? It's really interesting because we are in process. Um, I work for SkyUp Airlines, and we are in process of discussing the in housing, for providing training for uh, our staff, and it's really tough thing to get people together for the classroom especially yeah. when uh, we have people everywhere now in many countries at the moment so is it any kind of uh, tips uh, you can provide how how you manage to get or maybe you think for some kind of still think about some kind of uh, online platform to use uh, for yeah. in-house yeah. trainings so first, greetings to Ludmilla, if you work with uh, SkyUp. I'm still impressed by her talk uh, last month. Um, Thank you. Um, maybe it was wrong that I've said we've only went through classroom trainings. System-wise, we've only had classroom trainings. And therefore, we've had um, training locations in Frankfurt, Hanover and Hamburg, so lo located through Germany. And we've set up like, <laughs> we've blocked all the meeting rooms and we've rebuilt them. And it was possible because we've had like the six weeks of training. And then afterwards, our IT department 
brought everything, I hope, to operations. So we bought the equipment and it was really like going to school, right? The meeting room looked a bit different, but you've had like the full setup with how you want to work during a training. Um, but now that we are live, we've already planned how we're going to do like refresher and um, newcomer sessions right now, because of course we've had to give back our meeting rooms to the to the offices because otherwise they do not have large meeting rooms, right? So basically right now we've switched to a remote session, but I really think if you really want to train someone and also doing it the entire day, you need some live scenario because doing everything online is pretty hard. We've did some testing with the metaverse. So trying to put everything a bit more in a digital version. But it went OK, I would say. It was not like having the feeling of a real classroom training. And everyone, I mean, at least during our testing was like super disturbed, like hopping everywhere around, playing around with the avatar, but not like focusing fully on the training. So. I, I think it is okay and I'm super keen in especially doing like virtual meetings using um, for example also, also virtual glasses. Don't know if you've maybe thought about something like that. I think there is a lot of potential in doing so because we really spend a lot of money on traveling, buying the equipment and even also for Sky Up Airlines, for example, if you say the employees are spread around <laughs> Europe, then you will already cause even more travel expenses than we've did just for exactly. just yeah. for Germany, right? So maybe that's something you've thought about, like doing something virtually, but adding it something a bit more digital experience than just having the avatar jumping around the metaverse, for example. Yeah, we are thinking about several um, platforms uh, we can use for training because we have a lot of aviation training, obligatory training people have ah, to yeah. go yeah, through course. like for refresh their certificates. Uh, and that's really the issue, you know, what yeah. what way to arrange it the most effectively, I would say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, thank you. Thank you. So I think this was a fantastic presentation um, with a lot of insights and um, I hope the audience can also take some takeaways to be now change management agents for all <laughs> ladies beyond flying future projects in the world. Um, thank you Zina for this um, insightful talk. Good news is I'm already fully booked till July with fantastic uh, presentations from amazing aviation women and uh, so the next one will be then in February on the 20th of February we will have the 42nd aviation women panel and Alette van der Fair is talking about the redefinition of future aircraft uh, design and um, I'm sure this will be also a fantastic talk and uh, she is also comparing aviation and Formula One so I hope you can join it. Thank you very much again. Um, I wish you a fantastic 2024, that all your wishes and ambitions become true. And uh, I, I would be very happy to welcome you in our upcoming Aviation Women Panel. Stay healthy and safe and looking forward to have you with us soon again. Bye-bye. Thank, 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.